where you see where you see the uh, schematic picture of the planet Earth. And there you can choose English or Russian language for translation. We will have fully English uh, presentation with the English language uh, uh, discussant. And uh, I invite you to write questions and to uh, participate in English. However, if you would like to ask a question in Russian, it is also possible because we have uh, translation. So uh, back to the scheme, we will have uh, 45 minutes of the presentation by Anatoly. Uh, then uh, usually we have two or three minutes for the possibility to ask a question if you didn't understand something in the content of the presentation. So just a question to clarify something but not to really raise fundamental issues or comment extensively then after that we will have the extensive comment by professor todd Lubart, whom i have already uh, introduced and then we will have uh, 40 to 45 possibly 50 minutes for a general discussion and this will be the time where we will be pleased to introduce questions and <coughs> from the audience and uh, finally, five to seven minutes for the conclusive uh, summary by Anatoly Harhurin, uh, who will summarize what he had heard and what does it mean for the research that he leads under the framework of Human Potential Research Center. Uh, so uh, just a, a final formal remark, uh, as you see on this slide, we have uh, really a, uh, cross institutional cooperation under this project. And it is very, very important for us that uh, we, we can enjoy participation by leading international scholars in here, like uh, Professor Todd Limart. Uh, okay, uh, if you have any questions for understanding and for the general scheme, you may ask them now. If you have difficulties in assessing a translation option, you can also ask it in the chat. Uh, or I hope that everything is fine, everything is understood by the audience. And I am happy to invite uh, Professor Anatoly Harkurin, PhD, uh, the leading scholar in the direction of plurilingual creativity at work in the uh, high school of economics to begin with his very interesting presentation. Anatoly, you have 45 minutes. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for organizing it. And I'm really happy to finally present my work at the seminar. Uh, as many of you know, the, the World Class Research Center's initiative has started last year in 2020 and uh, uh, with the support of the uh, Ministry of Higher Education uh, we are conducting uh, many different projects uh, specifically the higher school of economics participates in this section of this huge project dedicated to development of human potential and that's what my presentation today will be about uh, and I would like to thank Professor Lubert for joining us today. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Lubert is a part of our project. Uh, he's a member of the research team, uh, which we call PIC, Plurilingual Intercultural Creative Keys. You, uh, we will talk about this in a couple of seconds. So, uh, and I hope that both uh, Professor Lubert and I will have an interesting discussion with you today about uh, creativity, multilingualism, and the related fields. So, uh, I'm starting my presentation. Um, um, now, uh, so the title of the pre presentation, Plurilingual Creativity at Work. Uh, the concept has been developed quite recently, and it grew out of uh, a different concept which had uh, quite a similar name. It was called multilingual creative cognition, and basically this uh, presentation today will be dedicated to the reasons for this shift. So uh, I'll be talking about the shift in paradigm from multilingual creative cognition and uh, from multilingual creative cognition to plurilingual creativity. Uh, uh, we'll have the following structure of the presentation. First, I present the old framework, the multilingual creative cognition. Then I present evidence and arguments for shifting from the multilingual creative cognition to plurilingual creativity. 
Then briefly, I'll discuss the factors in plurilingual development and plurilingual experience, which might influence uh, creative behavior. And, and then I present very, very recent evidence, the empirical evidence that we have collected, uh, uh, in fact, as we speak, the data is being collected and some of the results have been already uh, obtained and I will present these results briefly. And finally, I move to the, uh, the educational program, which actually presents the core of the project uh, taking part in the world-class research centers, the plurilingual uh, creativity education. And I will discuss the program, which is called PIC, Plurilingual Intercultural Creative Keys. So let us begin. Um, the, uh, the multilingual creative cognition uh, is uh, dim, uh, in the framework of multilingual creative cognition, the general finding was that there is a positive effect of bi and multilingualism on creative cognition. A number of studies in this uh, uh, in this field demonstrated that people who speak multiple languages show uh, advantages on various uh, tasks related to creative cognition. And uh, two studies that you see here uh, published in 2018 and 2019 present a very nice overview of this field. Now, so what is the nature of this multilingual creative cognition? As you can see from the term itself, it rests on a well-known framework in creativity research, which is called creative cognition. Now, in this framework, creativity is perceived as an ability to initiate multiple cycles of divergent and convergent thinking. Now, Convergent thinking is the ability to extract creative ideas from the pool of the, those ideas generated during divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is traditionally defined as the ability to generate a multitude of often unrelated ideas. One of the classical tests of divergent thinking, the abbreviated Torrance test for adults, it has three activities. And let me demonstrate uh, these activities for you. Activity number one is the verbal activity. Just suppose you could walk on air and fly without being an airplane or a similar vehicle. What problems might this create? List as many as you can. So in response, uh, this activity takes three minutes. In response to this activity, you have to produce various problems. Activity number two, use the incomplete figures below to make some pictures. Try to make your pictures unusual. Your pictures should communicate as interesting and as complete a story as possible. And one of potential responses to, uh, to this activity uh, is something like this. Uh, uh, the, this response has been obtained from a case from Iran. So these, these uh, titles are in Persian. Uh, activity number three, See how many objects or pictures you can make from the triangles below, just as you did with incomplete figures. So it has nine triangles. This is something that has been produced by a Russian participant. Uh, so these three activities, each of them takes three minutes and altogether they are uh, rated on four dimensions of divergent thinking. Uh, on this slide, you see them under the section properties. Divergent thinking has four dimensions. Fluency, the ability to rapidly produce a large number of ideas and solutions to a problem. Flexibility, the capacity to consider a variety of approaches to the problem simultaneously. Elaboration, the ability to think through the details of an idea and operationalize them. And originality, the tendency to produce ideas different from those of most people. Now, so the, the cycles of divergence and convergence thinking create an active attention demanding process that allows generation of new alternative solutions characterized by novelty, 
something that is original or unexpected, and utility, useful or meeting test constraints. Now, in creative cognition framework, and this is the important, uh, the important remark that, uh, that uh, makes a very important contribution to multilingual creative cognition. According to creative cognition framework, everyone has the creative ability, but it is realized differently in different individuals. In other words, we all have a potential to be creative. We just need to provide particular circumstances to develop this potential. Now, there, are, uh, there is a large number of evidence demonstrating that speaking more than one language extends an individual's cognitive capacities. Some studies show that specific architectures of the mind are likely to promote later cognitive advantages. In other words, speaking multiple languages uh, extends an individual's cognitive capacities and promotes later cognitive advantages. Just a few seconds ago, we learned that according to creative cognition framework, uh, extended cognitive advantages may result in creativity, in creative thinking. Hence, acquisition and use of multiple languages may facilitate creative functioning. And that's, this comes as a core of multilingual creative cognition. So within the framework of multilingual cognition, uh, we have uh, studied several multilingual factors that might influence divergent thinking. The first factor that we have identified was the language proficiency. In a number of studies, it was found that balanced bilinguals, those who speak two languages with equal proficiency, outperform those bilinguals who are uh, dominant or unbalanced, who speak one language better than another. So the balanced bilinguals outperform the unbalanced bilinguals in language proficiency. Another factor that played a role here is the age of acquisition. It was found that early bilinguals, the ones who acquired the language, let's say before the age of five, uh, outperformed those who have acquired the second language later. So the, the early bilinguals outperform on various divergent. Then we went ahead to the cognitive mechanisms that might benefit from the multilingual practice. And the first cognitive mechanism that we found was so-called language-mediated concept activation. The idea behind this is the specific architecture of a lingual memory facilitate greater spreading in conceptual and thereby stimulates an ability to activate a multi emergent thinking. Uh, to explain the working of language mediated concept activation, we need to consider several findings in uh, Each other through shared conceptual. Although conceptual features. Zoli, I'm sorry, I think we have difficulties in the quality of translation. Uh, if translators are online, maybe they can they can uh, help us. Maybe we can wait for I don't know 30 minutes or 30 seconds, like half a minute, just to to make them fix. Because last minute the quality has gone worse. Mm. Dmitry Alexander, do do you have or, or Vladimir, do you have ideas what can we do to improve the quality? Vladimir, на все в порядке с качеством. Почему-то последний минут стало хуже слышно существенно. Окей, okay. ладно, надеюсь, станет лучше. 
Uh, Anatoly, please, please uh, continue. I hope it will improve. All right, no worries. Well, so the video, we can do the cut. So I'm gonna start from the beginning of this slide. Um, translation equivalents automatically activate each other through shared conceptual presentation. Although translation equivalents share most of the conceptual features, these two presentations are not identical. We have two translation equivalents. A word ball in English, the translation in Russian, the translation is irrelevant here. The French translation equivalent, word ball, would be ball in French. However, the word ball in English refers to all possible kinds of all possible kinds of ball, ball etc. The word ball in French refers only to small balls, like a tennis ball. So as you see, translation equivalents, although they share many conceptual presentations, they have differences. And, and this consideration is important for us because variations in the conceptual presentation of translation equivalents may result in the simultaneous activation of additional concepts which eventually of activation over a category. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, we have a suggestion from our translators that you have to reconnect to the uh, conference because the quality uh, is uh, uh, is going down. And uh, our check shows that it's, it's uh, maybe you should, you should disconnect and then reconnect again, Anatoly, okay? Is it possible? But is it my quality or the quality of translation? The quality of, of your connection to the internet is poor. Well, uh, you know, the, this is quite possible because uh, this is not the first time that I have. Uh, no, no, this. no problem. So, so I exit completely. Yeah. Yes. And then you enter again, right? So it will be just a minute. So, dear colleagues, we just have to wait for a minute, I think, because as you might have uh, felt the the quality is is not that that high. Unfortunately, even though the the story Anatoly tells is really fascinating. Павел, возможно, есть еще проблема у вступающего батарейки в наушниках садятся. А, окей. Тогда мы предложим ему, чтобы он выступал без наушников, да? Как он на тестировании вначале делал, да? Да, через Mac. Ну, через то устройство, в котором он сидит. Спасибо, Владимир. So I'm back on the track. Can you hear me well now? Yeah. Yes, now it is better. Uh, Anatoly, if, if, if you feel that the quality uh, runs worse, you may uh, put out the uh, earphones and speak just directly to computer because the hypothesis is that maybe the quality, uh, the, the, the energy in your uh, earphones is going down and that's why the quality of- No, no, the, I just said it was 100%. Okay, okay, okay. Then so now, the... now it's better anyway. So please do continue. Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the connection here for, from my office is not very, uh, very stable. So I, I do have issues every now and then with that. So I apologize for that. Let me uh, bring the slides. Yeah, now it's better, much better. Okay, please continue. Uh -huh. All right, uh, cut. So, as I said, uh, so, so basically the idea is the following. Uh, the words in different languages, even the translation equivalents in different languages are connected to slightly different conceptual presentations. And because two translation equivalents activate each other, they in turn activate their conceptual presentation. As you can see here uh, uh, in this, uh, classical model of uh, bilingual memory, we have these lexical features which are shared across two languages, then they have the lemma level 
for that is separated for L1 and L2, and then we have conceptual features which are uh, shared by uh, both languages as well. So here, where the uh, translation equivalence, so the two words in two languages activate each other, and they activate in turn their conceptual representations, the conceptual features, and as a result, uh, a larger pool of conceptual features will be activated, which would result in a large number of ideas being simultaneously activated, which is divergent thinking. Uh, I, uh, I can demonstrate this with uh, uh, the presentation of the word cat. So the word cat presented at the lexical level activates the semantic level representation which in turn activates uh, the conceptual level representation of a word cat. Uh, just one second, for some reason it started running by itself. All right. Uh, yeah, no, wait. Okay, so <clears throat> let me see. Okay, now, why does it start automatically? All right, uh, the word cat presented to a English German bilingual activates the semantic level representation of the word cat, which in turn activate the conceptual representation of the word cat. At the same time, the word cat can activate an additional uh, semantic representation such as the cat burglar. So the conceptual representation of criminal will be activated. So once the word cat is activated, uh, it also activates the additional meanings that contain the word cat, such as the semantic level representation, die Katze im Sackkauf. Uh, in Russian, it has a direct translation uh, the equivalent, the translation equivalent of the Katsim Zakkaufen in English is to buy a pig in a poke. So eventually, the expression to buy a pig in a poke will be activated. And consequently, the word pig will be activated. As a result, as we can see on this chart, two conceptual representations, which are not directly related within one language can be activated across languages such as the pig and the criminal. So this idea underlines the language media concept activation. Another cognitive mechanism underlying multilingual creativity is selective attention. Uh, it was found that attentional control is enhanced by bilingual practice. It was also supposed that it should support the creative problem solving. Now, the classical test of selective attention is the Stroop test. In this test, you have to name the color in which each word is printed. So for, for the uh, top left item, you have to say blue. As you can see, uh, the, the word, the meaning of the word red uh, confront the naming of the color blue of the first item. So uh, the purpose of this test is to see how effectively we can suppress the irrelevant information in this, in this case, the word red, and how we can pay attention to the in uh, to, to the relevant information in this case the name of the color blue now here, uh, on, on, on this slide i show you uh, how this test uh, how the performance of this test is being uh, is being calculated so you have four conditions the color naming control and the word reading control in which you have just colors or words presented to the reader and they have to respond to the color of the word. Uh, 
Then you have a third condition, that congruent color naming condition in which the color is presented uh, with the word in the same color. So uh, the word red will be presented in red. And then you have incongruent true color naming condition. Uh, uh, the one that I have just presented to you in the previous slide. As you can see on these graphs, the incongruent condition, the one that is most difficult, produces the largest number of errors, the chart on the right. And it takes longer to name the color of the word. So what we look at is how different people respond to this incongruent stroke color naming condition. What we found is that, first of all, we identified two mechanisms of selective attention, the facilitation and inhibition. Facilitation is the rate of the facilitation associated with the word printed in its own color relative to the neutral color naming condition when no word is present. Inhibition is the rate of inhibition associated with the word printed in another color relative to the neutral color naming now, in the study of bilinguals with different proficiency uh, in their languages, we found that highly proficient bilinguals reveal the activation of inhibition mechanism. And inhibition resulted in greater innovative capacity and thinking. Moderately proficient bilinguals uh, revealed more activated facilitation mechanisms. And this facilitation resulted in greater generative capacity, which in turn facilitated non-standard thinking. Altogether, the multilingual creative cognition delivered to us the following results. Both language proficiency and major acquisition contribute to language-mediated concept activation, which in turn facilitate divergent thinking. Both of uh, uh, both language proficiency if attention and selective attention facility divergent thinking and non standard thinking. However, the multilingual creative cognition paradigm appeared to have a rather limited perspective. The first problem with this perspective is the, the term bi and multilingual per se. Uh, the more recent studies in the field presented different approaches to the phenomenon of language acquisition, such as translanguaging, uh, translanguaging lingual multi-competence, and plurilingual. Uh, in the same fashion, the point of creativity appears much better thinking that was used as the a large number of models, seven piece models, I call four plus two plus one piece model, I will explain it to you. Systems model of creativity, 5A model, four in one model, seven C model. I, I, I just mentioned here uh, the uh, only a few models which emphasize the complexity of the concept of creativity. Mark Ranka, one of the prominent in the field of creativity, he will call this a syndrome. So uh, the problem that became evident to, to us is that both phenomena <clears throat> of bi and multilingualism and, creative, uh, and divergent thinking do not sustain the complexity of, uh, sorry, both concepts of bi and creativity uh, multilingual and creativity do not sustain the complexity of the phenomena to which they refer to. So we took the four plus two plus one perceived from the perspective of a process, a person, a place of press. Uh, now here, uh, the press, uh, or basically to environment and the influences the environment might have on a person's creativity. Persuasion, the ability of a person to, uh, to convince others in the 
qualities of the work they produce. Mark Crompton, in his studies of creative education, proposed another approach to creativity, such as creative potential. And recently, uh, uh, we proposed a seventh approach to creativity, creative perception. Now, the idea behind the creative perception is that all creative activity starts first from the perception of the creative elements in oneself or the environment. So we took this seven-piece uh, approach, uh, uh, approach to creativity as a very general framework. Now, once again, the, each of these approaches look at creativity from slightly different perspectives. So process emphasizes the processes uh, underlying uh, creative thinking. A person emphasizes the personality traits uh, underlying creative thinking. The product looks at uh, different characteristics of a creative product, plays press at the environmental characteristics, persuasion in the ability to convince others, potential, potential itself, the creative potential, and perception, the ability to identify uh, creative elements in oneself or the environment. Now, the problem with by a multilingual multi approach was these approaches took the so-called monolingual native speaker perspective in which they used the additive approaches. In other words, a norm is a person who speaks one language. Everything else, the capacities in the second and third and fourth language are just the additions to the monolingual normal state. However, uh, this appears to be not the case. If you, if you look around, if you look uh, at, diff uh, at different countries in the world, the majority of people are actually multilingual. Uh, they speak two or more languages. Therefore, this idea of monolingual perspective does not sustain anymore. Hence, we shift to a different perspective. The perspective has been introduced by the Council of Europe in 1996. It's called plurilingualism. Plurilinguals refer to interact. There it is. So here we are shifting the focus from the languages per se to the person interacting in these languages. So we are not striving to first acquire the language perfectly and then use it. No, we learn and use it at the same time. Therefore, we can talk about language acquisition. So what we look at is the language. Now, a collection of languages a person has at his or her disposal. Now, evenly developed to shift the competences in the variety of languages, dialect, and culture. So we're talking here about the practice, something that we do rather than something that precedes our activity. So it's not about language that will be learned and then we use. No, it's a practice of language use. Knowledge of multiple languages, as well as the understanding of the cultural and emotional context in which these languages were acquired, contributes to improvement of an individual community. Here we can talk about plural cultural competence, and I just want to quote this, um, this important citation. The concept of plural lingual and plural cultural competence defended the notion that plural lingual individuals use two or more languages separately or together for different purposes in different domains of life with different uses of several languages and never their lives could be very different. The major difference between multilinguals and plurilinguals is presented here on the slide. So we are not, uh, uh, multi refers to addition, like a sum, L1 plus L2 plus L3 
and so on and so forth. Whereas pluralingo talks, uh, refers to the, to the, the prefix pluri, refers to a collection, like a multitude of abilities. Like uh, one of the concepts that was linguistic multi-competence, right? So we are talking about the competences. And uh, the, the pace of English acquisition is not like in multilingual approach on one, then on two, then on three. We acquire these things at the same time. And I'm always using myself as an example of this. Although I was born in Russia and my native language as L1, sorry, my native language, my L1 is Russian. I'm teaching right now in English because uh, I would have difficulties lecturing, uh, lecturing about my research in Russian because I have acquired a specific vocabulary uh, in psychology in English, not in Russian. And uh, some of the languages that I acquired, I was relatively fluent in. Like, for example, when I moved from, from Russia to Holland, years ago, uh, and I started my study in the Netherlands, I acquired and I graduated in 2000 and I moved to the US where I prepared to learn English. I started slowly deactivating because I didn't need my form from Holland at one of the conferences, I had difficulties difficult communicating with him in Dutch, but it doesn't mean that I have lost his language. No, it is still in my memory. I just need some time to activate it. But it's not about time, it's about the motivation. Once I would need this language, I would, uh, I would reactivate it. Another language that I speak is German. I never learned German but I spend a lot of time in Germany. I, because German is very similar to Dutch, I, I was able to speak German, but I never proper, uh, properly acquired it. So I wouldn't be able to speak German in, uh, uh, sorry, I would not be able to lecture in German. But if I move to Germany and I will start lecturing, I would be able to uh, adjust my level of German to the extent that, uh, that would allow me to uh, to lecture in this language. Now, now this example illustrates that uh, all these languages that we have, it's a collection of languages that we use with uh, to different degree, depending on the circumstances and needs of language use. So that's how we arrived to the concept, to the framework of plurilingual creativity. Now, uh, in plurilingual creativity, we pay a lot of attention to sociocultural experience. The studies, the acculturational studies show that language acquisition is often accompanied by the adoption of the cultural values of the country in which this language is acquired. Creativity research at the same time shows that sociocultural values norms determine and shape the concept of creativity, which in turn may influence the way creative potential is understood and developed. Cross-cultural research shows the effects of multilinguals on creative performance is often confounded with the effects of multiculturalism. In fact, it is very difficult to disentangle the effects of multilinguals and multiculturalism. Variations in the manners of socialization Degrees of self-perception and self-expression, education, and social conduct may modulate the differences in creative performance of the representatives of different cultures. Hence, individuals' experience with multiple sociocultural settings may encourage their creative behavior. At the same time, there is sufficient evidence that shows that emotional experience play an important role. Here. Emotions can either help or hurt. At the same time, emotions are realized differently in multi multilingual languages. Emotions in different linguistic contexts can lead to a variation in creative behavior. So, in plural framework, 
we consider emotional and sociocultural experiences together. These factors, sociocultural and emotional factors, uh, build the build on the intercultural competence. There are many different models of our cultural participation right, on so-called orientation of global competence, uh, according to which the intercultural competence as a presence of cognitive, behavioral, and affective abilities. Intercultural refer to interact. And not only that, to, to resolve conflict. But it's also called in the four personal attributes flexibility, the ability to change cognitive structures and behaviors, cross cultural empathy, the ability to connect emotions with representatives from other cultures. To maintain a relaxed attitude toward an unclear situation and mindfulness, the openness to the variations in the communication flow in people, people's cultural perspectives. As you see, many of these personal attributes perfectly overlap with the attribute, personal attributes underlying creative behavior. So, how can intercultural uh, creative personality? Cognitive flexibility. This trait allows the individual to find different perspectives. Lingos were found to out on flexibility. Andre, I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, messages in chat that the quality is, is decreasing again. So can you please try to disconnect and reconnect again so that we have the final part of the presentation in the in definitely, high. definitely. Just just a minute, we, we, we will wait, no problem. So I, I invite everybody to think about possible questions and comments. So let me remind you the, the scheme. So uh, after Anatoly will finish his uh, very interesting presentation, we will have opportunity to ask questions for understanding if we're uh, afraid that we misunderstood something just to two or three minutes and then uh, extensive comment by professor Lebart and then the general discussion so uh, by the, can you see my full screen slide now yeah uh, does it move uh, wait I just want to, does it move yes it does okay good so uh let's look uh, the contribution of intercultural competence to creative personality traits, cognitive flexibility. It allows an individual to find different perspectives, to switch between perspectives and outside the box. Also, the flexibility and thinking. Tolerance of ambiguity. This is the studies show that people who speak more than three languages outperform those who speak one or two languages on this trait. Open mindedness, openness to different cultural constructs, open and unprejudiced attitude toward our group members and towards different cultural norms and values. Uh, open mindedness refers to openness to new ideas and experiences. Uh, there was found that advanced knowledge and frequent use of was linked to open mindedness. The other two factors, another related to confidence or preference for complex and motivation. Uh, creative perception predicts creative behavior. Now, creative perception, uh, creative perception of the environment was defined as the preference for complexity. Plurilingual individuals live in a complex linguistic and sociocultural system. I will not elaborate on this thesis because it would require extra 10 minutes, but 
we are talking here about the complexity caused by uh, simultaneous activation of several languages and several uh, sociocultural systems of meanings. Hence, plurilingual practice enhances preference for complexity. And finally, motivation. Creativity generally prospers under conditions of intrinsic motivation and suffocates under conditions uh, accentuating the ex extrinsic motivation. Motivation is also found to play a pervasive role in language learning. So altogether, we have identified a number of factors that may benefit from plurilingual and pluricultural experience and at the same time contribute to creative thinking. And the very recent empirical findings that I promised to you to present here, I'm not, I'm not presenting any statistical analysis. Uh, those of you who might be interested in, we can uh, talk about this after the presentation. I just give you a very, very general trend. So first of all, we had three, uh, three factors, language repertoire, the number of languages spoken by a person, multicultural experience, and intercultural competence. And we looked at how these three factors contributed to divergent thinking. What we found is that multicultural experience and intercultural competence have a direct contribution to divergent thinking. Language repertoire did not have a direct contribution to divergent thinking, but it moderated the effect of the cultural factors. In the following study, we found that the personality trait of extroversion moderates the effect of cultural factors on divergent thinking. In one more study, we found that language repertoire through in intolerance of ambiguity contribute to divergent thinking. Here we talk about the, uh, the, me uh, the mediation analysis. So uh, intolerance of ambiguity mediates the effect of language repertoire, multicultural experience, intercultural competence on divergent thinking. So you see this one, two, three, all three through intolerance of ambiguity to divergent thinking. Tolerance of ambiguity mediated only the effect of multicultural experience on divergent thinking. And uh, the, ver the, the most recent finding here, uh, paper, uh, is that the personality traits of extroversion and neuroticism moderate the mediation, uh, the mediation of intolerance, of ambiguity, of the effect of intercultural competence on divergent thinking. So all these findings show to us that the idea to move from multilingual creative cognition to plurilingual, uh, to plurilingual creativity made sense. Indeed, there are more factors in plurilingual and pluricultural experience that, uh, that contribute to divergent, uh, to divergent thinking. The next step in our studies will be to expand the concept of creativity and to uh, and look not only at divergent thinking, but also at other aspects of creativity, such as, for example, creative motivation or preference for complexity. But these are the ideas for the future study. Finally, we found a way to apply our findings in the education. So we are talking about the plurilingual creative education. The reason for this is the following. We have well-established educational programs, one for language learning and the other one facilitating students' creative capacities. These two do three minutes, okay? Three minutes, okay? We're running out of time for three minutes more, okay? That's good, that's good. Uh -huh. Systems, although they're well-developed, they virtually do not intersect and do not interact. None of these systems look at the nurturing of intercultural. However, the studies that I presented to you 
relationship between linguistic, cultural, and creative competence. So the greater synergy could be established if we develop a program that would capitalize on the assets of both forms of education to establish an effective and comprehensive curriculum. Now, since we are running a little bit out of time, I will skip through these slides here. I'm just presenting the differences between the monolingual approach to second language learning and plurilingual approach to second language learning. Uh, and I focus on the actual program, <coughs> plurilingual intercultural creative keys. The idea of this program is to develop the systemic adaptation, the adaptation of a person in the contemporary world. And we claim that multilingualism, multiculturalism, and creativity together, here we have this greater synergy, together contribute to systemic adaptation. So the program, therefore, focuses on developing the creative potential, foreign language learning, and formation of intercultural competence. Together, the program is to uh, develop personality traits and various skills and abilities in the school students. The important characteristic of this not with school children working with their teachers. We are working with people who deliver the content. Uh, and the program is in the form of three more. Teachers go through each module and present it once a year to, uh, to work with the acquired knowledge uh, during this half or they, they have lectures, workshops. The creator, this module for potential. The second module the is open to everyone, competence. And the third module, which we call New Language, New Life, following the Persian proverb. Now, here we, we provide teachers with the tools to stimulate foreign language learning. Now, in addition, as I said, we have the whole series of lectures and workshops uh, where they are button in which we develop the intrinsic motivation for learning activities and maintaining curiosity of school children. The comfort zone, here we create a favorable psychological climate in the educational community and simply about complex, developing critical thinking and the ability to implement project activities. Now, here I have a very extensive list of all the references that I used throughout this study. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Anatoly. It was a very interesting presentation. We had some difficulties in uh, terms of the quality of uh, uh, incoming sound, but I think that we may suggest that if you would agree to allow us to publish a presentation on the official uh, Human Potential Research, Research Center website. We will uh, publish it there so that everyone can run through it again, uh, along with the post news, which we will make uh, after the presentations. After after the sure. Yeah, yeah. I will send to you the your presentation. Great. So, uh, dear colleagues, now uh, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions uh, on understanding in terms of clarifying. Uh, some notions or uh, ideas. Uh, if you have uh, uh, such a question, please, you may write it in chat or you may raise your hand uh, and I will see it uh, via Zoom and I will give you a word. I can wait for I don't know, 20 seconds. Uh, anyway, we will have time uh, after the uh, comment by uh, Professor Todd. Uh, so if if there is no questions on understanding, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, please, uh, Professor Todd Lubart, uh, the floor is yours. You have 
uh, from 10 to maximum 15 minutes. Uh, you may comment on anything you want uh, in terms of the rich content we just heard, please. Okay, thank you. You hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, and I, I thank Anatoly for that very interesting talk, which covers a lot of work that he and his colleagues have been doing over the years. So it's nice to see it all put together. Um, uh, so as it was said, I'm working on creativity. I'm at the University of Paris in France, and um, I'd like to make comments organized three ideas. First idea is that, as we saw, these the plural lingual people, they have a uh, obviously diverse plural lingual experience. They may have more or less languages. They may be uh, having a stronger language. They may use these languages in some context and a different language in another context. And they are probably exposed to plural cultural um, contexts in their life. Okay, so uh, the first idea, main idea that I got, I'd like to comment on, is that these people, the plural linguals, they have an advantage to be creative in general. Why do they have an advantage? I'd like to mention the multivariate approach to creative potential. The multivariate approach says that creative potential of a person or a team, if you have group creativity, involves some thinking abilities, cognitive abilities, like mental flexibility. It involves some personality traits like openness. It involves some emotional characteristics like having a rich emotional lifestyle. And it involves some context factors like having a stimulating place where you live. And these ingredients come together to form the potential to be creative of a person or a team. You can take the potential and use it in the process of creating and produce something thanks to your potential. So you have more or less of these ingredients, more or less quality ingredients, and this leads you to more or less potential. And so one idea is that the plural linguals they um, have enhanced ingredients. They have enhanced cognitive ingredient because they're used to switching from one language to another. So they can switch also from one idea to another. They have a richer semantic network because they have concepts connecting. Okay, that's the cognitive richness. They have a personality richness, maybe openness, maybe because of their cross-cultural uh, exposure through language, okay? Uh, and their lifestyle, because if they speak many languages, they probably go into different cultural contexts too. Uh, third, they have emotional richness, maybe because the words in different languages have different emotional connectors to them. And they have perhaps a stimulating cultural environment where they obviously move between different contexts that have different value systems and so forth. And so they have enhanced ingredients. And so this leads them to enhanced potential, which they can put into action, maybe if they're motivated, and leads to enhanced production. So that's the first idea I wanted to mention. The second idea is that um, the second idea is that it's quite interesting to take what you observe about plural linguals and 
that's the observed. That's the, uh, they are naturally plurilinguals and they show naturally some more or less creative behavior. And there's a shift between that whole line of work and the educational work. Because in the educational work, you take what you found about plurilingualism and you try to use it to benefit people in general who are maybe monolinguals. And that's the educational branch. So there is a major shift between observing that plurilinguals have something that looks pretty good for creativity and saying, Let's, let us extract this knowledge and turn it into learning packages that will help everybody who is more or less plurilingual or monolingual so that they can be more creative for example. So I think that's an interesting, um, let's say, uh, um, shift in how to think about plurilingual. You've got the um, observed phenomenon. It happens like that, okay? And you've got the um, proactive version of plurilingual, which is more educational, which is what uh, they, Anatoly and the team at, are doing in the PIC project. Then the third thing I wanted to mention is that obviously there are, this whole um, plurilingualism could be placed in a much larger cultural context discussion. And I did work uh, sometimes on the cultural aspects of creativity. And you may notice that in different cultures, first of all, creativity has some nuances of what it is, which differs. So when you say creativity in one culture, it means some stuff. In another culture, it means a little bit different stuff sometimes. It's got a family resemblance, okay? In one culture, it doesn't mean fruits and vegetables. It always means producing new ideas, but the nuances are a little bit particular to each culture. So uh, that's the first point. Second point is that in different cultures, what it means to be creative, who should be creative, in what topic could they be creative varies. And so um, in addition, uh, this notion that creativity is going to be more or less uh, an extension of cultural objects that are well known or a break from cultural objects is also a debate and a variability factor. So, um, so when you talk about plurilingualism, obviously the plurilingual language is a major vehicle for culture. Uh, and so you have pluriculturalism connected to it. And um, when people who are, uh, let's say, formed in one dominant culture, monolingual or bilingual, but essentially monolinguals who speak another language a little, they have one cultural vision of creativity. When they go to another place, it might fit more or less. And so um, if you take some of the measures of creativity that were shown, divergent thinking, Torrance test type measure, in some countries, they see that as very relevant and meaningful test. In others, they see that as a very strange test that has almost no meaning to them for what they mean about creativity. So if you're able to do the task well, in some cultures, it seems like funny or irrelevant as a task. And so people in some cultures are not motivated to do that task because it seems so stupid to them. So um, you see that there's a, a lot of uh, issues, okay, um, in which uh, some, 
in some, uh, you may find people who in one culture, poetic creativity is very valued. And so they use their language there to do poetic creativity. In another culture, visual arts creativity is the place we think people should be creative. And so maybe the plurilinguals have multiple exposure to different cultural contexts, but maybe the plurilingualism is going to impact their creativity differently or less in that other more visual arts culture. So I just wanted to add some nuance to the complexity of this whole deal uh, because uh, what Anatoly presented, I really liked it, and it was very clear and clean and coherent, and I congratulate him on that. Um, but when you pull away the, the cover, it gets a little bit messy underneath, and we have to acknowledge the messy nature of it all, because um, uh, obviously, you, you, you need to have the whole story here. I just want to bring that in as a discussion issue. And so um, that's my commentary. I hope the timing is okay, Pavel. Yes, Todd, it's, it's perfect timing. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have uh, something like uh, 40 minutes for general discussion. And uh, I again would like to remind that uh, everybody uh, is welcome to write questions or comments in chat or to raise their hands in, in Zoom with a special option of reaction. And I will notice it and give you a word. So I will <coughs> let myself begin. Actually, it's a very important uh, seminar which we have today uh, because it uh, openly uh, deals with the, the complex, the, the, the complexity of the uh, major object of the whole big mega project of Human Potential Research Center, which is a five-year lasting project. And one of its aims is to bring uh, scholars from different disciplines together and to bring together fundamental issues with educational interventional projects. And actually what uh, Anatoly presented is uh, a very brief uh, but yet comprehensive attempt to uh, draw this picture of fundamental uh, concepts of some kind of ontology about what is the world about, what is the uh, language, what is the creativity, and also to uh, make a scheme of uh, direct educational inter intervention. So uh, I, as a sociologist, I, I do not have a, a very high proficiency in, in the discipline background that uh, Anatoly is definitely and Todd are experts in, but I, I have a following a comment and, and a question to begin with. So uh, it was very convincing when you said that uh, being open to different uh, linguistic systems uh, is likely to enhance uh, an ability to be creative, to, to make a larger number of, of connections between different concepts. And uh, I, as a sociologist, cannot help thinking about the very famous Bourdieu's and uh, other sociologist uh, idea, but uh, Pierre Bourdieu was probably the most convincing in that, that actually language is not important in connections between different cultures and, and states, but also for the vertical hierarchies inside a, a society. So I, I think, uh, so what, I would be very interesting to hear the comment on uh, if you say, take high class uh, French, uh, well, a uh, group of people with from the very elite of French society, and you take the uh, people from the working class of, of France. Uh, so it is the same culture, more or less, they speak in, in your terms, the same language, French one, but what, what would you say about the, uh, the openness, for instance, to both circles, elite and, and, labor, and labor class, in terms of stimulating creativity of such a person? Uh, so it will be very interesting for you know mitigating issues of inequality inside within a society, not only uh, you're talking about uh, different societies and people bilingual in in the or plurilingual in uh, this understanding. So it, it it is my question. Just would like to 
uh, he recommends on this, you know, the theological uh, uh, reading of, of language and, and habitus related to it with, with the way you, you interpret plurilingual uh, phenomenon. So if, if you can please uh, comment and, and then uh, Enrica Picardo, I see uh, a hand. So she will, she will go uh, after that. So Anatoly or, or Todd, who, who, will, who will take my, my question if it is understood? Um, yes, uh, let me start uh, uh, with, with uh, interpretation answering your question. Uh, the first thing that came up to my mind when you were asking this question, thank you for this question because it's, uh, it might open a very long discussion and uh, Professor Picard may even join us on this, uh, on this discussion. Uh, she is, uh, in fact, an expert in plurilingualism. So I'm sure I'm looking forward to your question, Enrica. But uh, coming back to French philosopher, the first thing that came to my mind was the Bernard Shaw's play, My Fair Lady, uh, and uh, which clearly shows the distinction between the languages spoken by different members of the society. Uh, so uh, would we say that uh, uh, different uh, socioeconomic uh, <laughs> classes in, uh, within the same country uh, have the same culture? Yes, they do. To a certain extent, uh, they have a number of overlaps. Uh, Aneta Pavlenka, uh, when she talked, uh, she, she worked in the field of uh, bilinguals and multilingualism. She talked about the conceptual representations of bilinguals and specifically she uh, discussed how cultures may have an effect on conceptual representation. So um, she, um, she defined cultures in terms of the conceptual frames which allow us to interpret our experience in one or another way. And that's what probably would make a cultural difference. We build different conceptual frames um, uh, based uh, on the cultures in which, uh, with which we have experiences. So people from different uh, uh, socioeconomic groups like uh, elite and, uh, and the other groups, they might develop different. So it's not only that they speak different languages but, uh, or slightly different languages. The use of languages would be different, but they also might have different cultural frames. Therefore, we should not consider them as representative of one culture. For that very reason, when we run cross-cultural studies, we always have to be super cautious about the controlling for these factors such as education, socioeconomic status. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was my kind of comment on your uh, on your question. So, Todd, please. Okay. Well, I'll add something, but I'm totally in line with what Anatoly said. But I'll add something because you mentioned the example of the French. Uh, and I am in France at the Université de Paris, and I have been in France for 25 or more years, although it's not my first culture or language, okay? So, uh, but um, I think that your question is very interesting and important because it highlights that plurilingualism and its cultural connection can be seen at the so-called national culture level or at the next level, which is within a culture, within a nation, you have subcultures. And so you've got subcultures based on socioeconomic level. You've got subcultures based on regional level. Like I live in Brittany and we got a subculture that's different from the Southern France subculture. We've got some words and some phrases and idioms and stuff. Um, you've got age subcultures and they have different language like the textos that the youth have 
is not the same abbreviations of textos of another age group. You've got the um, professional culture of your job and, and different jobs have different subcultures. Um, and so culture is a nested or multi-layer thing. And so you've got dialects or, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you'll see people who, when they're, when they're in a high society event, they speak a certain way and they think a certain way. And when they're in, in a home event uh, with the neighbors who are not maybe the same uh, kind of uh, social milieu, they speak differently and they think differently. They're, and so you've got this uh, uh, interesting thing that is similar to what I think in the talk presented, we were more at the uh, national cultural level type of uh, concept, but it's, it's very much uh, replicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, great. Uh, Enrico Picardo, please. Please. Can you please I was turn muted, your... sorry. Yeah. I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Okay. And we got picked the University of Toronto. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy, uh, Anatoly, that you presented this because you made a very good overview of this uh, difference between seeing languages as a separate items that just uh, pile up and the complexity of seeing them from a plurilingual lens. And I'm so very happy too that Todd stressed immediately this complexity because even in what you have just said, Todd, the, you, have, uh, re, you have referred to the cultural aspect, but that's uh, the essence of plurilingualism because each of these layers that you listed has different languages. No? So the idea of plurilingualism is not just having multiple languages as coded phenomena that exist out in society, but also the varieties of the languages, the, um, the dialects, the sociolinguistic variety. And the whole point is becoming aware of this difference and or, or educationally trying to raise this awareness to improve that so that precisely once you are in a more complex, you embrace a more complex view of things, you're not afraid of exploring and therefore uh, probably becoming or being more creative, not, not afraid of when necessary, breaking barriers, and then when necessary, go back to the norm. So I really think that it, it gives a key to start to seeing things from a different lens. Um, and, and in your presentation, there were many moments of, that were really interesting because you try to connect different aspects. Now, that I, I totally agree that, um, that as you scratch, as you said, below the surface, there is the messiness. And I agree totally, but the messiness is plurilingualism, is this vision of, uh, um, of embracing complexity instead of trying to, uh, to uh, separate. And the models you have created, uh, Todd, your multivariate model, are all complex models uh, that, that try to capture, to remind us that there are all these layers that we have, we cannot forget. So it's a, it's a bit of a pity that in the end, you, you had to run through maybe, Anatoly, if you want just to say a bit more about the practical experience, uh, without even the, the, the slides, just telling us a little bit more, that would be a, a great point. And uh, I'm happy that Anatoly contributed to the book we have just uh, edited, uh, the Rutledge Handbook of Learning Well Language Education, that tries to give a panorama of these complexity. 
Thank you, Enrica, for first of all joining us. I'm really glad to see you. We haven't seen each other for ages, probably last yeah. time it was together with Todd in France. Exactly. Uh, when, we, when we saw each other live. Uh, so, um, and um, thank you for your comments. And I wanted to mention your book because uh, the book that you, you mentioned already, uh, uh, because this whole presentation today, this whole shift to plurilingual creativity was due to your invitation uh, to invite uh, to 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 invite uh, your invitation to contribute to that book, and once I started working on this plurilingual, the the idea of plurilingual is the context of this edited volume. Uh, I developed this idea further, and uh, when you were talking about the complexity, and then Todd before that uh, talked about complex complexity, I also want to emphasize the complexity. So Todd said that once you open the lid and you see this messiness, it is not messiness, Todd, it's complexity. And uh, uh, in the slides, I mentioned the several models, including your seven C's, Todd, and uh, Vlad Glavinius, the 5A model, and all these seven piece models. So for many, many years, creativity has been perceived almost equated with divergent thinking. And uh, it was, I mean, it was interesting, but it was relatively simple. The same, uh, and, and, and recently over, I would say last 20, 25 years, this complexity of the phenomenon of creativity uh, came up. Exactly the same with the, with the bilingualism. I mean, yes, bilingualism. Uh, in Canada, we talked about bilingualism. Uh, Pile Lambert in the, in the 60s, when they started publishing all these immersion programs, in, it was in Toronto, right, Enrique? Uh, it was Montreal where they did uh, that. It study. was Montreal, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, bilingual Montreal, yes. But they talked about bilingualism, not even multilingualism. And now the, this is an enormous shift to plurilingual and the translanguaging and this linguistic multi-competence. In, uh, in early 2000s, when I started my dissertation, my supervisor, his, Arthur Rieber, he's uh, famous, well, he's relatively famous in the field of implicit learning, and he's an author on the digital of technology. When I uh, uh, came to him with uh, idea of my dissertation on uh, bilinguals and creativity, he said, but that be kidding me. Don't, don't even start it, don't even open it. Nobody knows what bilingualism is. And he was like hardcore American, right? Monolingual as it is. Uh, and, uh, and nobody knows what bilingualism and I mean, creativity, don't even touch this. And a lot of people share the same sentiment until today. So the idea of plural linguals, the idea of creativity is a complex, uh, are very important ideas, and it is very important for us to open this this pot and to look inside and to enjoy this complexity and to smell this complexity. Like you know, when you have this complex recipe for borscht, or I don't know, like uh, so, so some some other borscht is good because we are in Russia, uh, right? So we enjoy this complexity and we enjoy studying this complexity. So that was my comment. And now, uh, Enrique, to your request about the program, um, this, uh, this is a very new endeavor and uh, I think a year ago, maybe now it's probably more, two years ago, when I talked to you on Skype, uh, and I think I mentioned these ideas, they were in the, they were almost like virgin ideas. Uh, so now we have it developed to a certain extent, and uh, we built a, a well-defined conceptual framework of competencies. Uh, the competences are defined according to three principles. Well, the competence is skills, knowledge, and attitudes. And uh, along these three dimensions of competencies, we develop those modules that I showed you on the slide. So we have a module, we bring together, we haven't started yet. 
uh, we are planning because with this pand pand pandemic situation, it's not easy to predict what's going to happen in schools in two months, right? But we aim to start maybe uh, in August if everything will, will work uh, well. So in August, we're going to have a group of teachers. Right now, we have uh, the Memorandum of Understanding uh, with uh, four schools in uh, Russia. So uh, we're going to have a group of teachers. And uh, uh, these teachers go through the training of the first module, the creativity module. It's a three-day training. Then they have one day to do the homework. They have to prepare the project and then they deliver the project. At the end of the training, they're gonna get the certificate and then they go back to school. Now we accompany this, this whole enterprise with the whole battery of tests, pre-test, post-test for both teachers and, uh, and school children. Uh, so for one semester, uh, these teachers will uh, um, practice the skills that they have acquired they come back to us with uh, their comments and uh, complaints and whatnot along the lines we're gonna present them with uh, lectures workshops uh the end of the semester we do the the the, the post test uh, the post test and then january next year they're going to do the second module and then we go through this uh, cycle again so three modules after one year and a half they should have this uh, this uh, all three modules ready uh, and uh, and we have the whole the handful of data uh, on uh, what was going on there so after after that period we will we, we will publish the results to see whether the program was efficient Natalia, I see there is a question on the chat about what are the schools which you are selecting uh, to run your project and whether it is possible to join because uh, to join you and to, to take part in this project it is, it is a question from Natalia. You can see it on chat. It is in Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, in Russian, uh, this question. So, uh, yeah, please. Uh, yes. Uh, so right now we have signed the memorandum of understanding with the uh, uh with uh, one school in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, one school in Petigorsk, uh in St. Petersburg and in uh, in Mo one school in Moscow just recently we uh, uh, we signed this. So yes, uh, the answer to the question can we join? Yes, you can join uh, in the chat. I'm gonna paste the link to our website for this project. And uh, there, there is a button that you can just click and uh, fill out the form. Uh, so we have separate buttons for individual teachers who want to go through the training, who want to participate in the training. And we have a button for the school. Uh, if like, for example, the principal of the school wants to wants to participate uh, actually the link is uh, uh, the link is uh, to a russian website but it, it has also english uh, translation so those of you who are interested uh, you, you can just switch to english and, and read about it in english okay thank you uh, so colleagues i have to uh, well underline uh, that uh, so the, the topic of today's seminar is actually not the presentation of empirical uh, uh, results of analyzing the ethics of intervention. It is very important that with the uh, Human Potential Research Center, we have this very huge uh, logics of having fundamental research connected with planned intervention. Then we have this intervention, then we measure and uh, publish and perform the results which we have obtained. Uh, so, and that is why I think it is, it is very correct that Anatoly preferred to focus the majority of his presentation on, on this fundamental well uh, foundations of, of the very project. And I, I have to return with some question or about this fundamentals of, of the whole idea. And actually these are two questions. Maybe Anatoly will 
uh, ask, we'll, we'll, we'll answer them one by one. So the, the first one is very simple. You had this very interesting scheme of four plus two plus one piece. And uh, well, in, in, uh, partly in contrast with this very beautiful scheme with cats and pigs, uh, you didn't have uh, these uh, seven Ps in, in a scheme. So I, I didn't quite understand how do they relate to each other, whether these Ps are well in a competition or whether they work all together some holistic, logically non-contrastant way. So this is the first question. And another question is uh, perhaps again, uh, more on sociological well uh, understanding, but, but maybe not only. Uh, well, when you mentioned English or French or German, uh, not only a linguist, but uh, to my mind, these languages are generally on, on more or less the same level of, of complexity, of complexity of the language itself. But if you take, say, Russia, there are more than, I don't know how many, but I believe more than 100 languages in Russia officially. But some of them do not have even, uh, you know, written written well uh, level of exposure so they're only oral languages so i wonder how do you take into account in your research uh, the issue of the uh, fundamental characteristics of languages itself just a, a very quick illustration uh, well uh, isaac fruman uh, said recently that he he read somewhere and i think it's it's very well uh, sounds like true that uh, in, in, in Chinese society, if you want to become the, the, to obtain the proficiency of the highest level of this language, it is much more difficult than to become highly proficient, say, in English, because Chinese language is inherently more, more difficult, more complicated. It's, it, it demands more from you to, to operate with this language in terms of very simple, uh, I don't know, narrow cognitive schemes that you have to, to learn. So uh, can you comment on this in terms of the, again, the, the, uh, the essence of language in terms of its, its complexity and perhaps the number of words that you have in language? It is also a measure that may, may vary. So can you comment on these two questions? First about seven Ps, and another question is about the, the, the quality and complexity of the language itself. How do you take this into account? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Pavel. Um, all right. So, uh, Seven Ps. Seven Ps is about approaches to creativity. So the, as we mentioned on a number of occasions already, creativity is a syndrome or a complex. And uh, because, because of its complexity, it has different approach. And within the, even within the field of the study of creativity, there are different approaches which do not always intersect. So these seven Ps actually reflect this complexity. So we look at creativity as a product, as a person, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the beautiful model that I had very little control of today because it was running with all these arrows just running without my control. I was trying to stop it. This is the LMCA model, Language Mediated Concept Activation. This model I proposed to explain how bilinguals have advantages over monolinguals on specifically divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is only a small portion of this complex of creativity, specifically divergent thinking. And as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, Guilford some, some 50 years ago uh, uh, proposed that Creative thinking occurs as a result of the multiple cycles of divergent and convergent thinking. And that was uh, also a simplification of the matter, right? So LMC talks solely about this small portion of divergent thinking. So it is much smaller than uh, this uh, seven piece approach. Now, coming to the second question. Uh, now, the reason why I kept talking about uh, English, German, French, and uh, other languages, because uh, these are the languages I know. Uh, this is the languages, let's say, we know, right? So the, the, the research in Western countries, uh, which actually dominates, still dominates the field, although we get more and more research from, from Asia, from, from China, from Arab countries, uh, 
Uh, these researchers are, are also familiar with uh, those languages, uh, although there are plenty of dialects in pretty much all geographic regions. We have dialects in Africa, in Europe, in the US, we have dialects. Dialects, uh, or uh, the languages which do not have, uh, uh, which are not written languages, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and this is a very important question because. Uh, indeed, we should take this variety and these uh, tiny distinctions between dialects in consideration as well. Can we say that we can put, and uh, uh, yes, okay, uh, I don't want to open the floor to a large discussion because we don't have that much time, but still, uh, can we say that Chinese English bilinguals are the same bilinguals as the ones who speak Chinese and Mandarin, right? So uh, there is a lot of research in bilinguals that has been done with the Spanish Catalan uh, uh, bilinguals. Are they the same bilinguals as the ones uh, who speak Chinese and Russian, right? So, and, and the, this is a very big discussion in the field of, uh, of multilingualism. Uh, what is interesting for me personally is how these differences in languages that a person speaks would realize in their divergent thinking, in creativity in general, but I think in divergent thinking specifically, because to, from today's presentation, we learned that due to this language mediated concept activation, we have a large pool of simultaneously activated conceptual representations, which is caused partially at least by the translation equivalent, right? So the activation jumps from one language to another, and therefore they activate different conceptual representations, different from monolingual. But now we have Russian Ukrainian and Russian Chinese. Would they have a larger span of conceptual representations? Sorry, would they have different spans of conceptual presentations activated? Because two, the, the, uh, Russian and Ukrainian are very close and uh, Russian and Chinese are very different. And this is an open question. And actually I have a project which I have presented, I think, uh, together with my student. He, he did a, a, a thesis uh, on that I, this year or last year, I don't remember. We presented at one of the conferences there the topo topological difference between, uh, between languages. Uh, how do, do these, these uh, distances play the role in their diversion or maybe if we extrapolate it in creative thinking. But again, this is something that uh, I can only speculate about because we did not receive any uh, convincing data yet. Thank you, thank you, Anatoly. Uh, Can maybe... I add one thing, Pavel? To yes, yes, please, Enrico, please. Yeah. Um, I think that talking about languages in that way, in kind of absolute terms, this is more difficult and this is less difficult, or this has more, uh, you know, dialects, etc. It's not the best way. I mean, it's not very much in line with the plurilingual view because every language is made of several layers of complexity and what it means being very difficult yes chinese is very difficult for an, a west a person from a western country but probably for a korean is not the same story as for us so it all depends on the distance that you have linguistically and culturally vis-a-vis -vis that culture and and one of the points precisely of plurilingualism is to, in a sense, a bit provocatively, but to show that we're all plurilingual, but sometimes we don't know we are. And every language is made is a compositum of many other languages. And not always we, we are aware of the etymology or the, the influences or the different uh, impact uh, of different uh, languages for political reasons because some have been silenced some have some are old in time ancient in time etc so uh, 
and there is this kind of layered view that should not be forgotten. Yeah, thank you, Enrico. I totally thank agree. you, Enrico, for uh, for uh, adding this because it was a part of Pavel's question, but I forgot to answer it. But I totally support uh, Enrico's view that uh, it's uh, again the complexity of languages. It's difficult to say these languages are more difficult to learn than others are easier to learn. Depends on your native language, and uh, yes. Uh, I wonder, uh, can we, uh, do, do we have an empirical confirmation that uh, across the time span, we see increasing proportion of people or, or part of population, at least for Western countries, which that actually operate more than one language. So do we, do we have such data that for instance, 20, 20 years ago, well, 50% of, uh, I don't know, French population spoke another language other than French. And nowadays, these are not 50%, but 75%. If, are there empirical uh, well, evidences for this? Um, now, there is data. Uh, uh, there is a journal, the European journal, it's called Eurobarometer. And they publish reports on... Uh, the proportion of Europeans speaking different languages. And just recently, so I used the data from 2006 uh, in, my, uh, in my book, which was published in 2012. And, and then I wanted to use the same data more recently, and I looked up the updated version of, of, of this report. I don't remember the numbers, of course, uh, but there was an increase in people speaking not only two languages, but also increase in people speaking more than two languages. So people who reported that they speak more than two languages, there was more, uh, the, 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 percentage, uh, the percentage was greater. Maybe Enrica has data on, on that, maybe she can... Uh, well, I have data, for example, for, for Canada, just to give you a sense. In a city like Toronto, which is a typical multicultural and multilingual city, and there are many others like that, over 50%, almost 60% of the population speak a, a different language at home that is not a language that is not English. And if you look at each country, is, um, the proportion of people who speak multiple language or speak a language different than the, the official language at home is really big. And it's one of those silence aspects because everything is written in the official languages, you know, even in countries that, that have more than one official language, they do silence other languages from the immigrants, from the, uh, the, the communities, um, the minority communities. Uh, in North America, there is the problem of the indigenous languages that are totally silenced uh, in both in the US and Canada, but they are very big. I was looking at a, at a um, there are many, there are over a million of uh, native, uh, I mean, for us is the first nations, uh, the US called them Native Americans, but uh, it's the same idea. And there are a lot of, there is a large population, but this silencing is killing these languages, you know? Mm -hmm. And even in the minority, in the minority groups, uh, because there is no visibility and not, uh, valuing this diversity, second, third generation very often lose their, their language. So one of the points of plurilingualism is precisely to say you have an added value. And I think that your studies, uh, Anatoly and uh, Todd in creativity are so essential to prove to people that hey, there is value in this uh, linguistic diversity. You shouldn't lose it. You should, uh, even, even partial competencies are important. Mm. Uh, colleagues, I have a very short question. And uh, after that, I would ask uh, perhaps Todd and then Anatoly to, to make their final comments. Uh, maybe Enrico would participate uh, again with a short comment, but, but my 
question will be as follows. Uh, are there evidences that people who are more than monolingual, so who operate more than one languages, that there is a correlation between this uh, quality of them and their socioeconomic status, so that more uh, uh, advanced, uh, well, uh, classes, they have more languages uh, in, their, in their habitus. So that it is a kind of an, another aspect of perhaps inequality. Can, do we have evidence for, for this? Mm. So, uh, the question is whether people with a higher socioeconomic status would speak more languages. Yeah, that, that they tend they tend to speak uh, a bigger number of languages than people from the lower social uh, economic status. Uh, I have no data. I would guess that this would be the case because because of education and education uh, provides the opportunity to learn more languages uh, but i can also see that uh, other factors can play a role here and make it complicated such as uh, people with a lower socioeconomic status they speak all these uh, dialects and local languages uh, which may not be available to pe pe people with a higher uh, SAS. One of our colleagues from this uh, uh, International Network on Creativity and Innovation is conducting a study as we speak, and actually not the study, it's a meta-analysis of the relationship between SAS and creativity. And uh, I sent him some data on bilinguals and monolinguals. So uh, maybe uh, the next year we're going to have a study published in which we see the relationship between these three uh, the, between these three factors: uh, the socioeconomic status, creativity, and uh, the number of languages. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Enrico, please. Can I say something? Well, it's a bit of a myth in the sense that <clears throat> I, I'm happy you asked this question because. There is an attack on plurilingualism from, especially from some scholars um, who work, some North American scholars who work more in translanguaging, not all of them, but some, who say that plurilingualism deals only with elite languages or elite groups. Well, this is absolutely not true. It needs to be demystified because uh, there is this idea of, the, we have to distinguish learn languages that are learned at school. Yes, maybe they are these elite languages. You learn English, you learn Spanish, you learn French, you learn German. But plurilingualism deals with the languages, the linguistic repertoires of a person and their linguistic and cultural trajectory. And because there are, there are a lot of migrants now and, um, and immigrants everywhere and people also moving for work, uh, not, not to mention refugees, et cetera. So all these people have a, a linguistic repertoire and a trajectory that is the core of plurilingualism and, and is valued and is increasingly valued, including in the work of um, the Council of Europe that Anatoly mentioned. Um, so it, it's the idea, of course, we are still facing, um, and you're a sociologist, you're, you're better uh, situated than me to say with, with a kind of frames, uh, from the society that give a more value to one thing and less value to another. So we are fighting against these uh, things like the recognition of the language of the migrants if they come from a, a, a country um, where the, sociologically, you know, politically there are, I don't know, conflicts, etc. Maybe, maybe they are not so valued as other languages, or because it's a minority group, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is this is the core of plurilingualism to value precisely this. So it's uh, I don't have empirical data on telling you. Uh, this, but I, I can surely tell you that the, the, the idea is precisely to value those differences, all of them, and not make a difference between 
stronger and 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 uh, and weaker languages let's say thank you Nico, very much so now we have uh, i think not more than well five minutes at maximum so if if todd or on uh, if todd wants to say something now it's the best time and then we will have the uh, conclusive uh, word for anatoly please okay i just want to express one idea to add in here uh which is that the um let's say the central issue in creativity is being idiosyncratic having your own special associations your own personal connections not being like everybody else that is the source of being original okay because if you're just like everybody else you'll give the same ideas as everybody else and you won't be too creative so this whole issue of plurilingual and that people are or bilingual plurilingual that they are um, having their own personal mix of languages in which they use them. And, and we could say language is also within a language of um, dialects, okay? And um, this is linked to cultural mix. And the more you have a personalized idiosyncratic mix in your plurilingual system, the more you are positioned to do something and to think in a way and make connections that other people won't make. So I think that I just like to highlight, I think is an idea um, that connects with a lot of stuff that Anatoly presented and also that Enrica brought in to the discussion very nicely. Thank you, Todd. Now Anatoly, it's your final summarizing word. Yes, so I want to start with thanking everyone for joining us, because then I get into some other discussion, I'll forget to do that. But I do want to thank Pavel for uh, moderating the discussion for these wonderful questions, uh, really thoughtful questions. And uh, even you are not from uh, the, the field of psychology, creativity, or uh, multilingualism, uh, your questions provoke a lot of uh, thoughtful discussions uh today and uh, i want to thank todd for uh being a discussant and i'm so pleased that enrico joined us because it, it would have been natural to actually invite you enrico to be the second discussant but for some reason it didn't occur to me and you made up for for my mistake <laughs> and uh, uh and joined us and uh, in even this huge time difference now, why I'm mentioning all this, because the whole idea of the, this enterprise that, you were, that we are participating in, the project is called the World Class Research Centers and is funded by the ministry. The idea is to organize these large scientific clusters. Uh, our cluster in which the, uh, the Higher School of Economics participates is the cluster of human potential. So we aim, together with uh, uh, several other universities, we aim to develop a fundamental research to, to boost the human potential. And of course, the, the idea of human potential is very diverse and there are different aspects of human potential. But I think the two aspects uh, which we discussed today are very important. The creative potential, and the linguistic potential, because these two potential, the, these two competencies uh, can be developed. We all have this potential. We all have potential to be creative. Uh, again, I don't want to start this discussion about uh, the, uh, whether everyone is capable of creative thinking or creative production. This is out of scope of the, today's presentation, but I believe that we have we all have a creative potential. We also have a potential to learn languages. We have a linguistic capacity. And the fact that it is not linguistic, but multilingual, multilingual capacity doesn't change the picture and actually makes it even more appealing to us. So, uh, and, uh, and I was very happy that we had such, such an interesting and intense discussion today. Uh, 
uh, that would give a lot of thoughts to our audience, of course. And uh, uh, this, this presentation and discussion showed to us that uh, the, these potentials, the creative and linguistic potentials are essential for developing the overall human potential. And this is exactly what we are working, working on. And, uh, and I am glad that both Todd and Enrico participated in this because now we have very good connections with uh, Canada and with France. And uh, uh, I do hope for some collaborative work with Todd, we're collaborating already. And uh, I hope that with, uh, with uh, Enrico, we'll also continue collaboration some other colleagues of ours who joined the discussion. I would also like to welcome to collaborate uh, on, uh, uh, on the project aiming to develop uh, the human potential. This is a very important, this is a very important aspect of our, of our everyday life. We all have potentials. And uh, our major problem is that we, do not develop these potentials. We, uh, we limit our potentials. And uh, I believe that the, the fundamental research in this whole cluster would also inform both governmental and private uh, institutions about the importance of this human potential, the importance of developing this human potential so that more and more uh, financial support will be provided to, uh, to develop this human potential. Hey, yeah, that's, that's thank you. Thank We're you. just running. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I join the gratitude expressed by people in, in chat. So we will uh, follow with a huge interest the advancement of your beautiful project. And we expect next year to have uh, another presentation with Enrico, with Todd, with I think many, many others. And uh, in January, please follow our announcements about the next seminars on a Human Potential Research Center. Thank you, Anatoly. Thank you, Todd, Enrique, and everybody for following us. Thank you very much. So it's time to close. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you for this beautiful uh, event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. So thanks again and uh, see you around. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll be in touch. Bye okay. bye. Bye. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Anatoly. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, people.